Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the final session in our series, Species Distribution Modeling with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Prez and Zach Benson. Before we get started with today's content, let's review the logistics. This series includes three one and a half hour sessions, and this is the final session being held on August 19th at 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The recordings of each, each session can be found on the training website, and uh, we've provided a link to the website here. We will also have a question and answer session at the end of today's session, like we've done with the other sessions as well. And we'll be posting a um, document that outlines the questions and answers that we go through um, on the course website after the training is over. So if you didn't see your question answered in, lot, in real time or want to review, go back and review a question, do please come back to um, the training website. Also, we now have the homework posted on the training website. This is a link to a Google form. There's one homework um, for you to complete if you're interested in that certificate of completion. Um, so do please check that out and complete that within two weeks by September 2nd. Um, and you will receive a certificate of completion if you've, if you've completed that, as well as attended all the live sessions within about three months. It does take some time for us to uh, get those out to everyone. So just a heads up there as well. Here's an overview of our sessions. During the first part, we provided a general overview of SDMs. Um, during the last session, we had some fabulous guest speakers from Wallace to talk about their um, software. And then today, we're really gonna talk about a lot of different tools and projects focused on SDMs, in particular projects that have been funded through NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Thus far in this training series, we've reviewed how recent advances in remote sensing and image processing have led to critically important increases in the variety of Earth observations available for characterizing the environment, such as the types of ecological indicators like climate variables. And we've talked about our spatial and temporal resolution. We've also discussed how advances in animal tracking technology are providing time series data on animal locations that can be integrated with those environmental layers, especially through citizen science, data collection, and sharing portals. Today, we will focus more specifically on these SDM projects that have connections to the use of NASA data, or as I've mentioned, been funded under NASA's Applied Sciences Program. And these include the Mapping Application for Penguin Populations and Projected Dynamics, or MAPT, Wildlife Insights, Map of Life, Circuitscape and Omniscape, and the Fisheries and Climate Toolkit. Then um, we will have a training summary at the end of the session and time for question and answers. So let's jump right in with the first project that we're highlighting the Mapping Application for Penguin Populations and Projected Dynamics, or MAPT. MAPT is a project that was funded in NASA, but funded by NASA in partnership with Oceanides um, at the lab of Dr. Heather Lynch at Stony Brook University. This project focused on the mapping of penguin populations in Antarctica. Antarctica remains one of the planet's most changing environments for biological survey. Recent developments in remote sensing have radically expanded the opportunities for regular, high-quality biological surveys at the continental scale. As a result, Antarctica has become a model system for the use of remote sensing for biological conservation. MAPT is a web-based open access decision support tool designed to assist scientists, NGOs, and policymakers working to meet management objectives that were set forth by the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and other components of the Antarctic Treaty System. 
This tool integrates remotely sensed inputs such as Landsat images and MODIS sea ice data to provide an assessment of Adelaide and other penguin species across the frozen continent. They recently found the largest undiscovered co colony of Adelaide penguins on the Danger Islands in the Antarctic Peninsula with over 1.5 million birds. And we'll talk a lot about that discovery um, through the next few slides. MAPT serves three primary functions. One, as a mean by which data on the distribution and abundance of penguin species can be submitted, vetted, and stored on the public record. Two, as a tool for searching the existing state of knowledge on Antarctic penguin abundance and distribution, and estimating abundance at sites or aggregated abundance across larger areas of interest. And finally, three, to create and discover checklists of all bird species at sites along the Antarctic Peninsula that are likely to be visited by tour ships or otherwise impacted by human activities. So with this tool, the team really began to ask some big questions, such as, can we detect penguins using remote sensing imagery? Can we differentiate different penguin species? Can we estimate abundance? Can we start doing global or regional censuses? Can we learn something new about penguin biology? And finally, can we improve the decision-making process for conserving Antarctic marine living resources? To give you a bit more insight into the tool, the database underlying map includes all publicly available, both published and unpublished, count data on multiple penguin species. On the back end of the tool, this includes satellite imagery, contributed data from um, counters in the field, and published historical data. These data are then used within a Bayesian population model to estimate abundance for each site for each year. The results are easily aggregated across multiple sites to obtain abundance estimates over any user-defined area of interest. A front-end web interface provides free and ready access to the most recent count and model data. And it can act as a facilitator for data transfer between scientists and stakeholders. And the idea here is really to help inform management decisions. The first steps of this project were to create an algorithm to identify penguin colonies using the pink and brown coloration left by penguin guano, primarily using Landsat imagery across the entire continent. Some commercial imagery was also used in the creation of these algorithms. These algorithms were then used to discover several, several mega colonies of penguins, which had major implications for the larger understanding of seabird biogeography. In particular, a colony of LA penguins were found on the Danger Islands. And this is a region that scientists previously thought that was not inhabited by this species. The Danger Islands are not easy to get to because they're almost always covered in a thick layer of ice that precludes regular census in this area. Therefore, prior Danger Island colonies were not considered a high priority. Um, as you can see in this image on the left where it has the blue regions. But through this project, um, the conservation for marine prote protected areas has been expanded, as you can see in um, the pink polygons. And this was a direct result of the use of Landsat data to identify penguin species in this region. Also, due to the colony found via the POO algorithms, uh, Lynch and her colleagues journeyed to the islands for the full survey. Um, actually, Heather Lynch stayed behind to help the, um, the team navigate the, the sea ice extent. Um, but the team did travel to the Danger Islands um, and identified the seabirds via drone imagery. And this is an area uh, that generally doesn't even appear on most maps of the Antarctic because it's so small. So this was a really important um, place to visit. 
Some other members of the team also spent time figuring out what the penguins were eating based on the shade of pink in their poo in the satellite images. Um, whether they were eating krill versus fish, um, which affects the color of the poo. Another part of a dug holes into the island to learn a little bit about the penguins past. And through the use of radiocarbon dating, um, they revealed that the penguins had been hiding out on the island for a really long time, around um, over 2,000 years in this region. So here's a video um, using the drone that the team took of the area to identify the um, penguins. And as the drone moves, you can see this very large colony expanding across the danger islands of this, these penguins. The MAP team has also conducted more extensive research on the mechanisms that underlie the population dynamics. Colony breeding seabirds, seabirds have long served as an indicator species for the health of the oceans on which they depend. Abundance and breeding data are repeatedly collected at six study sites in the hopes that changes in abundance and productivity may be useful for adaptive management of marine resources. But their suitability for this purpose is often unknown. However, despite the community's resilience, reliance on Adelaide penguins as a marine sentinel, there has been nearly a 30 year debate over the key mechanisms underlying um, this species uh, population dynamics. To address this, the team fit a Bayesian population dynamics model that includes process and observation error to all known Adelaide penguin abundance data um, that covers over 95% of their population globally. The team's findings have important implications for the use of these penguins in Southern Ocean feedback management and suggest that aggregating abundance across space provides the fastest reliable signal of true population change for a species whose dynamics are driven by stochastic processes. So here the team found that continent-wide continent year effects are strongly influencing the population growth rates. As such, population growth rate was positively associated with peak winter sea ice over the previous four years, or to put it an, another way, negatively associated with prolonged periods without extensive sea ice or ice droughts. Growth weight rate was also weakly correlated with extensive summer sea ice. And this is observed, um, as you can see, in these top two figures. The histograms of actual winter and summer peak sea ice conditions for all of the 267 sites across 34 years are shown along the bottom. The bars have been color coded to represent values associated with positive, which are red, or negative, which are blue, growth rates. The gray bars reflect values associated with credible intervals that include support for both positive and negative growth rates. The team also found that the average population growth rate multiplier, which is the geometric mean of annual changes in the nest abundance across all years, was highly variable across sites within the Antarctic Peninsula. And there are extended periods of both increasing and decreasing abundance over the last three decades. In general, there's a marked and steady increase in abundance for most of the Antarctic con continent, with the exception of the South Orne Key Islands. And um, those are the, the figures shown along the top where they saw a decline. And I'd like to mention that if you're interested in more specifics about this research, we've included a link to um, a paper that was published on this work here. Through the use of driven data, the team also engaged the community to um, compete to create the best algorithm for mapping these penguin colonies. 
So with this competition, there were over 600 competitors that built different algorithms to predict, predict changes in um, the species of, of penguins in this region. The competition allowed a massive number of alternative prediction approaches to be explored. And um, the winning model outputs outperformed the top model previously created by the team. So th this model suggests that um, less signal from large scale environmental factors that can be measured from satellite compared with fine scale factors such as precipitation. Um, so this was a really interesting um, combination of citizen science and research done by the team for um, identifying these penguin species. So Matt has shown that through the use of high resolution remote sensing data, we can change the narrative of earth science applications and species distribution models and allow the scientists to really ask new questions. MAPS can be used as a tool to inform stakeholders about penguin abundance and distribution. And it continues to be a work in progress. So this is really important to note that um, the team of researchers are continually updating and modifying the tool. Um, and tailoring the tools for your specific audience is really important. Um, the, the team found this that um, being open and flexible is really important. Um, and the team did this uh, when working with stakeholders. They also created an R package um, that interfaces with the, the web interface to essentially meet the needs of the, the user. So these are some lessons learned um, throughout this, this project. And now I will move into a brief demonstration of the mapped web tool. So here's what the main page of MAPT looks like. Um, there are a variety of different options here along the top, and we'll just take a look at a few of them. So you can click on About Us and get a little bit more information about the team and some of the work that they're doing. You can also click on Publications and get um, the articles, the books, reports, um, a lot of information here especially related to some of the um, features and research I was showing previously. You can also see the um, four species that are being mapped by MAPT um, here and get a little bit more information about each of these species. You can also contribute to the team. So this is a really um, interesting feature um, where you can download um, sites of each of the four penguin species and use Google Earth to see if the team missed anything. So what you can do is download these KML files and really explore them and note the places where the team have tracked the penguin colonies and then see if there's anything that they missed. And if you think there was a site that was missed, you can contact the team and let them know about it. So it's a nice way to um, become involved in the project here. And um, the, the thing I really wanted to show you all is this data portal option. So if you click here on data portal, you can start to play with some of the data and, and take a look at it. Um, so here you can see all the different penguin colonies in orange that have been mapped. And you can search by a polygon, you can search by a specific site, or a species of interest, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, search by polygon. And then you can draw your own polygon here. And what we're going to do is just draw a square around the Western Antarctic Peninsula here by clicking on the map. And you can see the polygon will um, generate as I click on the map and then to close the polygon, you just click back where you first started. And then you'll be zoomed into this region. And this is an area where there are a lot of penguin colonies. Now what you can do is take a look at the results and you can see each of the sites they've identified listed here. And then you can get more information about each of these sites. So we're gonna take a look at Ardley Island, um, which we can see down here. So you can, um, 
go ahead and click on get image to see what this little island looks like here. And this is a Landsat image that was used to, um, to view this, this island. You can also find it on a map. If you click here, it'll pinpoint. Um, you see a little uh, red identifier here that that's where the island is located. You can also um, click on Get Polygon if you're interested in um, identifying that region more closely. What you can do here along the top of results is you can click on Counts, and we'll take a look at the Adelaide penguins, the ones we've been talking quite a lot about. And you can see the number of counts, um, the season of the, of the counts um, through here. You can also take a look at model output. And this will generate models of the um, species across time for whichever region you have selected. So what we're going to do is click on generate models. And this all of the data will load. And then you can view the population estimate for this region, all within the interface here. So then if we go ahead and click on view population estimate, we can see Adelaide penguin species nest at all of the sites across each of the seasons. And it's an interactive map, uh, interactive figure here where you can see how many nests were um, identified each year. And so you can see how the dynamics of the species, species is changing throughout time. You can also click here and download the image as a uh, download the figure as an image, or you can um, identify the um, or you can download it as a, a PNG, a JPEG, a variety of things if you're interested in taking a look more closely at the population. There are a variety of other download options, and you can also take a look at the citation guide um, to get a little bit more information about this work. So that is a really brief intro to um, the mapped interface, but really fun tool to play around with. So the next tool we'd like to feature is Wildlife Insights. As we mentioned in the first session, Wildlife Insights allows for the collection, dissemination, and analysis of camera trap data globally. Anyone can upload their images to the Wildlife Insights platform so that species can be automatically identified using artificial intelligence. So this saves thousands of hours of scientists actually going, on the tr going into the images and analyzing them. And by aggregating images from around the world, Wildlife Insights is providing access to all of the data we really need to effectively monitor wildlife. The first task for the AI models is to identify images not containing any animals. The AI models in Wildlife Insights catch about 47% of blank images with an error rate of less than 2.5%. This really allows Wildlife Insights users to minimize the amount of effort that they spend towards sifting through images that don't contain any animals. The second major component is the use of these models to classify hundreds of species. There are massive amounts of high quality training data used, over 11 million images. And the team has uh, data for 732 species, and there are still many more to track. This tool really benefits from the use of the Google Cloud, which can analyze images much faster than any expert. On average, about 18,000 images per hour, while an expert can process about 600 images per hour. The team is using deep convolutional neural nets for multi-class classification using Google's open source TensorFlow framework to train the model to identify animal species in the images. Like humans, 
the AI models generally get better at recognizing and identifying animals if they can look at hundreds of, or thousands of diverse images for that particular species. Within Wildlife Insights, you can view the accuracy for an individual species of interest using a search function. Here, I've searched for the peccary, which is a medium-sized pig-like hoofed animal found in Central and South America. You can see here there are two different species, commonly known as the collared peccary and the white-lipped peccary. And you can see um, in the image here on the right. Notice that the table outlines the number of images used in the classification and the precision, precision of the classification. You can see that the precision is lower for the white-lipped peccary, which could be due to a variety of factors. Categorizing species in camera trap data can be challenging, even for humans. Data quality can play a huge part in our ability to correctly classify an image. And even human experts struggle with images that are poorly illuminated, that are blurry, or where the animal is small or hidden behind vegetation. So there are many sets of species that are easily confused. If there is a particular species you're interested in studying, you can also contribute your own data to assist in this large scale classification process. When a new image is uploaded, Wildlife Insights does a forward pass over the trained network, such as running through all the layers one by one and extracts a probability distribution over all species classes. Wildlife Insights selects the class with the highest probability as the predicted class. So you can get involved with Wildlife Insights by signing up for an account. And there are two different types of accounts, one for a public user and another for someone who wants to contribute and manage data. And you can see the links here for sign up. Uh, please note that each new account must be manually approved before it's activated and recognized. So it could take a little while for you to get your approval. So now I'd like to show you a short video created by the Wildlife Insights team on getting started with the tool. Wildlife Insights is bringing cutting edge technology to wildlife conservation and providing all the tools you need to quickly get data from the field and into the hands of decision makers. What's different about Wildlife Insights is that you can manage, identify, analyze, share, and discover camera trap data all in one place. Start by creating an organization and project and invite your team to join. Creating a project is easy with our user-friendly interface and drop-down menus. Wildlife Insights ensures information is standardized so you can analyze data across many projects or organizations. You can even choose how your data is shared with standard Creative Commons licenses. Uploading data is easy with Wildlife Insights. Just select the project, create a deployment, and click Upload. Data is uploaded into cloud storage and passes through the artificial intelligence species identification model at the same time. Our filters make it easy to focus on images of interest, whether it's by species or separating out blank images. You can even group images into births. Births cluster images taken within a short period of time, so you can quickly process a whole group of images all at once. When you're reviewing AI model results, you can see the species predicted and even how confident the model is in its prediction. Our built-in editing tools let you adjust the image for a better view. And all of the important metadata is always easily accessible. You can even highlight and download images so you can quickly find your favorites to share with the world. Once you're done reviewing, save the identification and move on to the next. The Wildlife Insights AI model can even catch animals that are barely in the image. With bursts, you can quickly move through large groups of images in just a few seconds. 
Using the AI tools in Wildlife Insights can speed up boring tasks and help your team focus on analyzing and applying findings. It's not just about AI tools though. With Wildlife Insights, you can see analytics on demand. Species occupancy, species richness, detection rate, and activity budgets are calculated for organizations and projects in just a matter of seconds. You can even create an initiative, which lets you share projects with other organizations. Wildlife Insights is making collaboration easier than ever before. With the cloud-based platform, everyone's efforts are synced, so you can easily work together from anywhere in the world. And when you create an initiative, Wildlife Insights will automatically create a public web page so you can inspire others with your collaborations. Best of all, Wildlife Insights is building a global database of camera trap data and sharing with the world. But don't worry, Wildlife Insights puts protections in place to keep data on sensitive species secure. Anyone can visit Wildlife Insights to explore projects and get an inside look into the wonderful world of wildlife. Wildlife Insights is built to work the way you work and help you protect wildlife. Get in touch with our team to get started or visit wildlifeinsights.org to learn more. Now we will discuss the map of life. Map of Life, another tool we mentioned briefly in session one, is a web platform geared for large biodiversity and environmental data. The spatiotemporal distribution of species play a vital role in understanding ecological processes and for decision making for conservation and land management. Given this vital role of species data, MOLE was generated to host all of the available types of information about species distributions, to provide a model-based integration, to quantify uncertainty in individual and integrated data types, to implement simple data upload and allow the users to sp be spatially explicit, and to provide feedback to advance the biodiversity knowledge base. This was built as a scalable web platform for large biodiversity and environmental data. And it endeavors to provide the best possible species range information and species lists for any geographic area. A key objective is to derive the best possible probabilistic estimate of the occurrence of each species at the finest possible scale over a given temporal range using the maximum amount of available information. Because the strengths of one data type often offset the weaknesses in another, combining and integrating data from different types dramatically improves the species distribution knowledge base. It assembles and integrates different data sources describing species distributions worldwide, including things like species range maps, species occurrence points, ecoregions and protected areas. Much of the Map of Life team can be seen here. This is a project that's really focused through um, Yale University and the Florida Museum of Natural History and has many, many research and partners that are not all shown here as well. Um, funding and support for this comes from many institutions, including NASA, NSF, and the MacArthur Foundation. Within the interface, you can map species information on the fly. You can view such information as summary maps of the species range and as detailed maps that distinguishes where a species is a resident, where they have breeding locations, 
where there's non-breeding locations and passage corridors that include point observations, regional checklists, and gridded surveys. For select species with the information available, you can also view the species distributions, reserve coverage, habitat trends, and projections in habitats. Here's an example of the La Loma salamander range in Costa Rica. One of the newer features is the analysis and mapping of the Species Status Information Index, or SSII, which was recently endorsed as sound quantification of species occurrence data by the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network. Primary species occurrence records are essential for detailed understanding of the distribution of biodiversity in space and time. Yet, despite an impressive recent growth and now hundreds of millions of accessible records, the ability of this vast information to represent biodiversity and its change has remained largely unquantified. And this could be due to gaps in the number of records or in space and time. Thus, the SSII captures how well existing data covers the species expected range. The SSII can be computed across the entirety of species expected range and ignores national boundaries, or you can separate them within each nation where the species is expected to occur. There are two measures of species status, which are available in map form. And these are the national index, which measures how well on average a species is documented in a given nation over time. And there's also the stewards index that adjusts the national index based on the nation's stewardship of a species, upweighting the documentation of species for which a nation has particularly high stewardship. Map of Life also feeds data into the Half Earth Project, which is an initiative of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. This utilizes geospatial species distribution data and analytics to guide where we have the best opportunity to conserve the most species. You can highlight priority places for biodiversity for different species types, like those for birds indicated here, and use the map to get more insights into species biodiversity hotspots. You can also map areas of existing protection and human pressures. One example of the use of map of life is in a paper from Nature Climate Change from 2019. Here, the researchers use global decadal land use projections out to 2070 for a range of shared socioeconomic pathways, which are linked to represent, representative concentration pathways, or RCPs, to evaluate potential losses in range-wide suitable habitat and extinction rates for over 19,000 species of amphibians, birds, and mammals. Substantial declines in suitable habitat are identified for species worldwide, with approximately 1,700 species to become imperiled due to land use changes alone. These geographically explicit projections and model workflows embedded in map of life infrastructure are really helpful for assessments like this to identify areas of future importance for conservation planning. So now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Zach Benson, for a map of life demonstration. All right, thanks, Amber. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our map of life demonstration. Um, Amber went over a couple of the different features um, that you can use on map of life's website. Um, and we're gonna go over um, just two of those in a little bit more detail. Um, but just to give you an idea of the main page of Map of Life, um, there are resources here um, for mapping species here in this first icon. Um, this is really helpful if you're just interested in getting things like range maps, um, species inventories, um, some occurrence data if you don't have your own. Um, and then there are other uh, functionalities within the website um, based off of your own needs that you can select for. We're specifically going to be going over indicators and Projecting, projecting species. Um, so we'll go ahead and hold off on those for a second. Um, but you have a, a lot of opportunities to kind of explore species occurrence data, um, some of the, the ranges that are available from resources like the IUCN. Um, and you can also do this in kind of a uh, place-based way. You can look from country to country. 
Um, you can look at uh, species richness patterns um, from cell to cell within a country. Um, there's a lot kind of contained within this website. Um, so we're not gonna be able to go over all of it today, but I really encourage you to take a look um, after this demonstration. Um, and one important thing to note uh, here on this page is this data sets tab. Um, for any of the data that we go over um, within this demonstration, you'll be able to find out where that data came from uh, via this tab, as well as some of the links that are provided um, uh, in some of the interfaces that we'll go through. So I think the, the first place that we'll start um, is with the indicators function. So go ahead and click on that. And for our purposes, we're really interested in exploring habitat suitability. This is where a lot of the satellite data comes into play with Map of Life. And so we'll go ahead and click Explore there. And so within this, there's a, a few case studies that they've picked out um, that you can explore here in Map of Life, um, as well as going through some of the data for your own purposes for specific species. Um, we're going to focus on the Guatemalan bull today. Um, and these species were selected um, particularly uh, because they're cases of habitat specialists uh, with diminished range size um, and currently large conservation gaps. So it's, it's a series of really interesting case studies um, experiencing uh, current land use change and historical land use change. So the first place we'll start with the Guatemalan bull is in habitat distribution. So we'll just go ahead and click that. You'll see the interface pops up with the historical range of the Guatemalan bull, which is this gray outline here. And then the first thing that it shows you um, is kind of that habitat suitable range um, within green. You see the legend here. Uh, so the suitable range uh, is highlighted in green. Um, and any records of species occurrence um, that are within this range are in blue and any records outside would be shown in red. Um, but in this case, uh, all of our records are within the suitable range areas. So kind of how this works is uh, there's a set of defaults already set for the Guatemalan vole. Um, these are things that can be adjust, adjusted within the interface. Um, you'll see we have elevation here, uh, tree cover, as well as land cover. And these are all made uh, specific to the species that we're interested in working with. In this case, the Guatemalan vole. So you can see here the elevation limits are set to uh, 2,500 to 3,200 meters. Um, and then tree cover is set to 75% to 100%. And then we'll show the land cover preferences here. So in terms of land cover, um, we're selecting for things like mosaic cropland, uh, mosaic natural vegetation, and then a whole series of tree uh, broad-leaved uh, areas, essentially forested areas um, of habitat preference for the Guatemalan bull. And so these are things that can all be adjusted to different percentages. Um, depending on what species you're interested in. As I mentioned, we're just going to use the defaults for the Guatemalan bull because that's kind of our case study for this purpose. And then we'll go ahead and move down to the rest of this. Awesome. So that is how this uh, habitat suitable range is determined for the Guatemalan bull. We'll do a little bit of zooming in. You can see within that historical range, um, those areas termed suitable with uh, satellite data and other environmental data resources is pretty sparse. Um, a lot of land use appears to be happening here. Um, and we'll explore that a little bit more in other parts of this interface. So we'll go back here to our Guatemalan bowl and we'll look at reserve coverage. This is a really nice function that um, is contained within Map of Life. Um, it shows us our habitat suitable range that we've determined in the previous tab. Um, then it also displays those reserve and protected areas um, that can contribute to conservation of habitat for the species. So you can see in this lighter blue and yellow are parks, uh, which we would term as areas that are protected from future land use degradation. So we'll just zoom in here. And you can do a quick visual inspection of uh, what park areas have overlap with uh, suitable habitat range. Um, but they also have this really nice table off to the side here um, which shows uh, the size of any parks and then their overlap in terms of kilometers squared um, for uh, suitable habitat range. So we can see here um, that for parks of any size, there are 298.4 kilometers squared um, of protected area. And you can kind of set a, a target to protect and then it will provide a percentage here of what uh, target area of the habitat suitable range um, is actually being protected by a park or a reserve or something like that. And we'll go back to the last feature of this specific tool, which is habitat trend. 
And this just gives us a quick look at uh, trends in change of the habitat over time. Um, you can see the legend here, uh, loss is in red, no changes in blue, and gain is in yellow. Uh, you'll notice within this map, there does not appear to be any habitat gain. Um, and you'll see here that the uh, number of years that we're looking at is around 20. It looks like it's from 2000 to 2019. And we're basically just looking at land loss. So we see all the blue areas um, as uh, suitable habitat that has not changed. And then in the red areas, a su suitable habitat that's been lost since uh, 2000. Awesome. So this is a quick peek at um, some of the functionalities of Map of Life, um, a quick overview of kind of how we can look at habitat suitable ranges um, kind of in a spatially explicit way, and then um, looking at those from a protection standpoint as well as kind of a habitat degradation uh, trend as well. And so we'll go back to our main screen here and we'll just take a quick look at uh, projecting species. Click on that. And similar to our last case uh, with the Guatemalan bull, we'll take a look at a specific case study. Um, and one really cool thing about this feature of the website is that you can essentially project uh, habitat ranges um, over a series of socioeconomic pathways, um, something that Amber briefly went over, um, all the way to uh, 2070. And so these are the case studies available here. And um, there's also a publication here that I really encourage you to look at. It does a lot of great explanation about how these projections are made and then what those uh, shared socioeconomic pathways are. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the curve build uh, read hunter. Read hunter. And we'll see we have kind of our study area here in South America. And so what this is showing now is a projection for 2015, um, which is obviously uh, already taken place. Uh, we have data for this time range. Um, so we'll go ahead and make our first step as upping that projection to 2050. So that's the year that we'll be uh, projecting habitat suitable ranges to. And so this is uh, the habitat um, that the Kerfield Reed Hunter um, should in theory be able to occupy um, over the over the um, entire area of its suitable range or its uh, historical range. Sorry about that. And we can also select a shared socioeconomic pathway for that. And these are basically just different scenarios of climate change, conservation, uh, things like that. There are four choices for this. And just briefly to go over each of them, uh, the first SSP1 is um, under the assumption that we have a planet focused on sustainability. So it's kind of our best case scenario for conservation. Then we have SSP2, which is kind of a middle of the, re uh, middle of the road scenario um, of intermediate land use change. And then we have SSP3, which is uh, under the assumption that we have highly separate societies uh, with substantial challenges to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And then SSP5 is a scenario that represents a uh, fossil fueled but more collaboratively developed world. And so that was a really quick <laughs> summary of what those SSPs represent. Really encourage you to look back at that publication from the last page um, to get a little more information on that. But we'll go ahead and choose this kind of middle of the road um, intermediate scenario of land use change. And you can also check an assumption here. Um, that's either no regain, so that assumes that no regain of uh, potential habitat will take place, or you can choose regain in which uh, we could potentially see some sort of restoration. So we're going to keep it at no regain. That's kind of um, a conservative estimate of how we would see that habitat degradation. And then we'll go ahead and click get our projection. And you can see visually on the map we have uh, lighter blues, which if we look here on the legend, indicates a lower percentage of suitable habitat um, as compared to that 2015 projection that we were looking at. We'll take a quicker look in there. So you can zoom in, kind of navigate the different areas of habitat. Um, but another really helpful feature of this is it provides you with this line graph. I mean, it basically shows you all the way from kind of present day to 2070, um, how we would, we would expect um, habitat degradation to take place within this area um, for the range of our focal species. And we can see a general decrease um, in suitable habitat range for this particular species. So as a really quick intro to the Map of Life website, I really encourage you to click around um, and look at some of the case studies. They're there for you to learn. 
um, and maybe see if there are any other ways that this data could be applicable to your own work. So I'll go ahead and hand it back over to Amber. Thank you, Zach, for that great overview of the Map of Life interface. The next project we will highlight is the projects of CircuitScape and Omniscape. To give you some context for this work, let's first review a few important concepts related to connectivity and movement. Landscape connectivity the extent to which a landscape facilitates the movement of organisms and their genes faces critical threats from both fragmentation and habitat loss. Many conservation efforts focus on protecting and enhancing connectivity to offset the impacts of habitat loss and fragmentation on biodiversity conservation and to increase the resilience of reserve networks to potential threats associated with climate change. Loss of connectivity can reduce the size and quality of available habitat. It can impede and disrupt movement, and it can affect seasonal migration patterns. These changes can lead, in turn, to detrimental effects for populations and species, including decreased carrying capacity, population declines, loss of genetic variation, and ultimately extinction. Measuring and mapping connectivity is facilita facilitated by a growing number of quantitative approaches that can integrate large amounts of information about an organism's life histories, habitat quality, and other features essential to evaluating connectivity for a given population or species. Connectivity has both structural and functional components. Structural connectivity describes the physical characteristics of a landscape that allow for movement. So these are things like topography, vegetation cover, human land use patterns. Functional connectivity describes how well genes, individuals, or populations move through the landscape. Functional connectivity results from the ways that the ecological characteristics of the organism, such as habitat preference or dispersal activity, how they interact with the structural characteristics of the landscape. In three papers published by Brad McRae, he introduced this concept of circuit theory to many ecologists and conservation scientists as a process-driven approach to modeling gene flow and the dispersal or movement routes of organisms. So drawing from his background in electrical engineering, this was a key innovation in recognizing that circuit theory permitted a robust way to quantify gene flow. The approach provided a much needed theoretical basis for understanding and mapping patterns of connectivity and has been rapidly adopted in conservation science and other ecological disciplines. The development of an accompanying software, also known as CircuitScape, has provided an accessible means of implementing this circuit theory across a, a wide range of disciplines. This approach treats the landscape as a surface of resistors or resistance grid, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Circuitscape tracks where the current flows across this resistance surface, following the current flow from the source nodes or the, to the ground nodes, and essentially quantifying the spatial patterns of accumulation as higher resistance areas and barriers to flow pathways for these species. Here, the genetic distance among subpopulations of interest can be estimated by representing the landscape as a circuit board, where each pixel in a raster depiction of the landscape is a resistor, and gene flow between any two subpopulation occurs via all possible chains of resistors. So it's not just along a single chain, but it's a sum of these resistances. So thus, as a resistance surface, like the images shown here, is essentially a grid in which each cell value reflects the landscape permeability or the ability for the species to move um, or their genes to move through these regions. Um, and the functional connectivity can be things like the energetic cost, 
the movement difficulty, the mortality risk, or any avoidance behavior associated with species moving through that cell. So this is really thinking about the way in which animals move um, or plants move across a landscape. So when thinking about the applicability of circuit theory to landscapes, animal movement, and conservation, here are a few really key points. First, connectivity is not just about the corridor. We can think about dynamic landscapes and the matrix of resistance. Also, by identifying redundant movement pathways or habitat corridors, critical pinch points that constrain potential flow between focal areas can be identified. This is really useful in complex landscapes where those pinch points can be identified. This could then feed into identification of restoration opportunities and can provide the basis for reconnecting important portions of the landscape. So with all of this underlying theoretical basis, um, circuitscape and eventually omniscape projects um, were really developed. And the team spans across re researchers in many locations at the Nature Conservancy, MIT and Julia Computing, and along with um, some other conservation science partners. And support for this project comes from um, NASA, the Wilberforce Foundation, and the Doris Duke Foundation. So, Circuitscape, as we mentioned, is a widely used open source connectivity analysis software that has recently been migrated from the Python code to the Julia programming language. This builds off of the concepts we just discussed, where Circuitscape allows users to apply the logic and mathematics of electrical cir circuit theory to question how genes, animals, or processes flow across these heterogeneous landscapes. The spatial data used in Circuitscape usually represents things like habitat suitability, um, also things like topography, uh, climatic factors, um, and the resist resistance distance matrices can be calculated for many different surfaces. Circuitscape can be accessed via GitHub, and we've included the link here. Um, and it has been used for a variety of studies related to species movement, landscape genetics, et cetera. Um, I've included a link here to the paper that describes Circuitscape in more depth. And there are over 500 papers um, that have been published that use this model um, to, to understand these um, sorts of um, pieces of species movement or landscape genetics, um, in particular with potential shifts related to climate change. Omniscape is a newer algorithm that's built off the concept of circuitscape. It implements cir circuitscape to produce maps of omnidirectional habitat connectivity, and it offers a unique approach to connectivity modeling by allowing the sources, destination, and intensity of animal movement or ecological flow to be informed by continuous spatial data. The Omniscape algorithm works by applying circuitscape iteratively through the landscape in a moving window within a user-specified radius. This requires two basic inputs, a resistance raster, which we mentioned previously, and a source strength raster. The source strength raster defines for every pixel the relative amount of current to be injected into that pixel. So the link to the model, along with much more information, is available here for Omniscape as well. A really neat tool developed with the Nature Conservancy is Migrations in Motion, and that's shown here. Researchers from the University of Washington and the Nature Conservancy modeled potential habitat for nearly 3,000 species using climate change projections and the climatic needs of each species. Using the flow models of circuitscape, they plotted movement routes for each species, connecting current habitats with their projected locations under climate change. So now we will review one example of a project where circuitscape was used. And this was used to better understand 
sage grouse habitat connectivity. The greater sage grouse is regarded as a focal species for conservation of stagebrush steppe and great basin sagebrush communities, due in part to its broad range, its selection for habitat across multiple scales, and the widespread conversion, degradation, and fragmentation of this habitat. Habitat connectivity is important to the survival of individuals, the maintenance of genetic diversity, and the long-term persistence of metapopulations. So this project modeled this across southeastern Oregon to help inform the development of a comprehensive uh, conservation plan for this species. And um, it, it also engaged with a advisor to outline the goals of the project, which include modeled uh, modeling relative accessibility of localized areas around sage grouse clusters to identify linkage zones of easiest movement based on the landscape structure and to describe specific areas where movement might be constrained or fragmented. So here's the region in southeastern Oregon where this work was done. Um, and then please note there's a link to the report included along the bottom of this slide and along with many of the subsequent figures. So for any detailed questions about this work, please do refer to um, that report. So there were many inputs into the CircuitScape modeling software, which fall into three types, which include um, resistance layers like the Landsat Drive land cover, which is oftentimes a starting point for much of this work is to have that land cover layer there. Also, what's included in the um, modeling is um, the energy cost or movement difficulty category, the mortality risk, which is the risk of death to the organism from the landscape or anthropogenic features, um, and avoidance, which is a behavioral response of an organism to avoid a certain landscape feature due to things like noise, uh, visual obstruction, or perceived threat. So resistance weights and avoidance distances were assigned through um, uh, working with the researchers who really understand the sage grouse um, community. So here's a land cover classification area from the region that identifies the regions where sage grouse is likely to live and move through. This layer is included in modeling of the resistance due to how the bird will or will not expand energy to move through the landscape in the um, particular land cover type. Here's the associated resistance layer that maps the difficulty of movement for this bird through that particular habitat. The darker colors represent the regions that are more difficult to travel through, thus indicating greater energy costs to the sage grouse. The darker the color, the less likely the sage grouse will move through that region. And here is a resistance map for mortality and avoidance. Higher resistance values indicate, indicate greater mortality risk or resistance due to this avoidance behavior. The highest mortality risk values are um, visible and they reflect high housing densities and those are shown in red. And um, the highest visible avoidance resistance are associated with the uh, dark blue colors and these are things like power plants or high voltage transmission lines. So given these two resistance layers, here's a combined resistance surface. Higher resistance values indicate greater cost or difficulty for the sage grouse movement. And the warmer colors here identify higher resistance. So then with the resistance map, the team wanted to identify these least cost corridors. And these are mapped in relation to the individual least cost paths. And so this really um, reflects the number of alternative paths um, that have similar habitat. So this identifies linkages of potential pathways through higher quality habitat. 
And so if you zoom in, this is what these linkages zones look like. And um, within this is where the team really conducted their circuit state, skirt, circuit state modeling. So one of the first features mapped in the circuit state model were these pinch points, and we talked about these earlier. Where, and these are locations where the flow is constrained or intensified due to bottom. These pinch points are visible with a warmer color, whereas the, um, the violet follows those original linkage zones. So at the pinch points, network connectivity could be severed with the loss of a relatively small amount of dispersal habitat. Therefore, they really resent, represent key places for prioritized habitat protection. So you can see those here. The results can be used in several ways to support planning and management for sage grouse. So mapped corridors and metrics of relative linkages and quality robustness can be used in combination with population data or other management factors to really um, inform and prioritize these regions. So now the final project we'll highlight today is the Fisheries and Climate Toolkit, or FACET. So with FACET, we're shifting gears a bit. We're focusing on um, ocean management. And before we launch into an overview of the tool, it's really important to discuss this framework. Um, this idea uses neural time data to guide the distribution of commercial activities to address a fundamental challenge of ocean resource use. And that challenge is really how to balance the economically viable industries with ecological sustainability. Dynamic ocean management applications integrate the highly dynamic nature of species, ocean uses and users, and underlying features of the ocean. And a lot of this is fueled by many of the advances in remote sensing and the available data that we have. While dynamic ocean management applications have been developed in support of ocean resources worldwide, there have been fewer advances in, in how the dynamic ocean management applications can focus specifically on promoting climate resilience for current and future fisheries management. Distributions of highly migratory species and of fishing fleets are shifting in response to climate driven changes. And there's a growing um, concern of greater ecological as well as economic disruptions as we see these impacts increase with climate change. So with existing management and conservation strategies, we need to consider these, these um, effects into the future. And all of this ties directly into um, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which really um, addresses the uh, life below water. So the Fisheries and Climate Toolkit aims to address many of these issues with their large network of researchers and partners that are all shown here to develop tools and applications in support of climate ready and sustainable fisheries. This effort is led by Cameron Braun at Woods Hole and Rebecca Lewiston with San Diego State University. And it's another project that's funded um, through NASA's Applied Sciences Program. So there are many needs in the fisheries community where remote sensing can be used and are the focus areas of FACET. The first is conducting forecasting and providing predictions. And this includes identifying factors that influence climate projections of species and vessel dynamics. Essentially, the question being asked here is how can we capture and characterize uncertainty in models across a range of temporal scales for near to long term? Another important need for this is the tracking of of the magnitude and the velocity of change, such as how quickly are projected changes likely to occur in species and then in the vessel movement. 
And how can the historical data help us characterize likely changes um, in the future? Harnessing big data and data pipelines is another really important piece of this work. It, this relates to the computational infrastructure and how to improve the dynamic modeling. And then finally, as I've mentioned, this is all related to climate change uncertainty in a fisheries con context and communicating that climate uncertainty for stakeholders. So given these needs, the goals of FACET are to develop an online products that enable the tracking of dynamic species and vessel distributions, as well as um, looking at environmental and vessel observations, and that's shown here. In particular, this will feed into a variety of applications of fishery interactions and hotspots and how um, best to inform management under climate change. So to give an example of the usefulness of FACET, um, we are gonna talk a little bit about shortfin maco. And according to the 2017 stock assessments, these sharks are overfished and are subject to overfishing. They um, really grow quite slowly and they can live for long periods of time. And they're not able to reproduce until about eight years old for females. Oh, eight years old for males and 19 years old for females. So um, they, they live for a long time and they, they don't reproduce until many years after um, they are born. They're found off of the East Coast, Atlantic, all the way from New England to Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico from Florida to Texas and in the Caribbean Sea. They are also a really um, highly migratory species and thus have complicated management that requires international cooperation. So a shark that's off the coast of Florida one week could be caught off the coast of Mexico the next. Um, so these resources have to be managed on an international level. And these sharks are primarily caught incidentally in longline fishing that targets swordfish and tuna. Um, so there are current regulations to uh, minimize this overfishing. So one of the data sets used within the FACET team is um, shown here, and this is an example of big biological data. And this is a, um, these are presence and absence points of the shark along the North Atlantic Ocean. As we've discussed in this training, we've talked a lot about building models from animal occurrence data by relating presence and absence to the environment and then predicting what habitats are suitable for that particular species. Those suitability models can be used then to um, identify suitable habitat for a marine protect protected area and to um, affect closure of a region to maybe help that species. So in this example that you see here, um, this is a closure along the Charleston bump. And in the green, you can see how suitable habitat, habitat for the shark has increased in green with the recent closure here. So the team has also worked on the analysis of modeling vessel distributions Atlantic coast and then considering how these locations may shift with climate change. In this animation, you can see vessel locations from 2012 to 2018 for each month um, for January to August. And this was actually done for all of the years, but we are just showing um, January to August um, in this slide here. And these data are collected from a broadcasting system um, called Shipboard AIS, and this identifies the locations of these vessels. Using these same observations, models can be used to predict where the vessels are likely to be distributed based on the environmental niche they tend to occupy. So shown here, 
um, higher suitability is indicated in purple and yellow um, for this species and therefore um, where the vessels are likely to be distributed um, for fishing activities. The team can then look at the species and the vessels data with a changing climate. So the team is working in the US West Coast and you can see data for the Western Coast here in blue and the East Coast of the US in red. And they're assessing the effects of climate change impacts on the fish and the fisheries. So these are just a few examples of what the team is working on and they're continuing their efforts um, on the development of their online platform. So stay tuned for more on that. And um, do please check out their website on the first slide for more information about this project and the tools that are in development currently. So for in summary, for this training, we reviewed how species distribution models are used to assess the suitability of a habitat for a species. We've provided examples of environmental and occurrence data and tools for acquiring those data. We also reviewed some popular methods and models for establishing these statistical relationships to generate habitat suitability maps. We were given an in-depth look at Wallace in our second session, and this is a, a user-friendly application for SDM that is accessible, instructive, flexible, interactive, reproducible, expandable, and open. And then in today's session, we talked about a variety of um, species distribution modeling projects and tools um, that include MAPT, Wildlife Insights, Map of Life, CircuitScape, OmniScape, and the Fishers and Climate Toolkit. So we covered a lot of ground today. And um, as we wrap up this training series, we always get a lot of questions related to the homework. So as a review, there is one homework um, available now on the course website, and this covers material from all three sessions. Um, in order to obtain a certificate of completion, you must have attended all of the live webinars and complete the homework by September 2nd. So that's two weeks from now. And it really takes some time to process all the certificates because we have thousands of folks from around the world. So please give us about three months to get you your certificate of completion. So I wanna thank everyone for attending today. I've included our contact information for our RSET eco team. Um, if you have questions, I've included the link to the training website here. and. Also, please visit our RSET website for um, more training um, trainings available in a variety of application areas like water resources or health and air quality, agriculture, climate. We have a lot of trainings going on and we will have a lot more in the future. So do please take a look at the website for more trainings like this. And again, thank you everyone. And we will now take some time for question and answers. Great, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna to take a moment here and move into our question and answer document. Um, again, I just wanna recognize the many, many people from around the, the globe who've joined us today. Um, we've talked a lot about um, some tools and projects that really focus on SDM. Really happy to, to be part of that. Um, I also wanted to mention before we jump right into the questions, um, we have provided the project websites and contact information here on the question and answer document. Um, as uh, these projects have a, um, a large diversity of team members and um, specifics that we may not be able to answer for you. So we do really encourage you all to um, visit the websites, uh, contact, the uh, PIs or the projects directly there. And so we'll, we'll include all of this in the um, question and answer document when we post it to the website online. Um, and do please check back within a few days for that. 
I also wanted to mention again our homework. We have the one and only homework. It's uh, the link is available on the training webpage under the session three area, and um, you can complete that online and submit that within two weeks to uh, be eligible for that certificate of completion. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into a few of our questions. A little less time for questions today than we have in the past because we had so much to cover, um, but we'll get through a few of them. And again, if you don't get your question answered, uh, you could always email myself, email the project teams um, listed here. Okay. Great. Uh, question one. I was wondering if there are data on pest Looks species like distribution that could be used. Looks like you may have lost me for a minute. The question is regarding um, pest species and how to access data for pests. And during session one, we discuss EdMaps. And this is uh, a web portal specifically focused on invasive species and pests. So I would take a look at that. You can also check out GBIF. GBIF is something we've talked about in the last two sessions. It's a Um, one of the largest repositories of um, species occurrence data. And you could also check out Map of Life. So you can search by a, a species interest on Map of Life. So there's a lot of resources there um, for pest species. Okay, uh, question two. The question is asking what are the sources of data for mapped? Oh, and it's, um, we actually combined two questions here as they were similar. Um, the question also talks about um, Landsat having 30 meter spatial resolution and what objects you can detect on the ground to indicate penguin presence. Um, and can you name some of the other species in MAPT? So as we talked about in the lecture, the really innovative uh, piece of MAPT is their ability to use Landsat data to identify penguin colonies via the, the stains left over by their guano. Um, and so as Amber was saying, uh, the really innovative piece of MAPT is that we can use those guana stains on kind of the surface of the ice, the surface of the landscape there in Antarctica um, to really identify locations where there are penguins. And then um, Heather Lynch's team has come up with uh, a really great algorithm that allows them to take that full extent of the guano stain and then essentially uh, calculate the uh, number of penguins that should in theory be within that extent of guano stain. And so that's how uh, they're using Landsat uh, imagery to indicate penguin presence as well as abundance, um, which is something that's really useful. Um, and then I think another part of this question was, can you name a species uh, MAPT can study? So MAPT is restricted to uh, penguins. Um, so those species are Emperor, Adeli, Gentoo, and Chinstrap, Chinstrap penguins. Um, we've also included the link there to the MAPT website um, for some species listings. I think there was another part to that question, just asking about kind of in total what data was used for the mapped platform. Um, so in addition to that Landsat imagery, there's also occurrence data from the field. Uh, Heather Lynch and her team uh, do go to Antarctica um, usually once a year to, to do some of their own field assessments of penguins. Um, and then they also do a lot of uh, drone imagery scans um, looking for penguin presence as well. So that type of occurrence data that's uh, on the ground really helps them refine um, those species distribution models that they then put into MAPT. Um, yep. So moving on to question three. Can the bands of a multispectral image like Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2 be used as environmental variables in species distribution models as a way to find the distribution by reflectance? Um, and the short answer is yes. Um, we discussed um, some of the variables and uh, environmental predictor layers in session one. So do please refer back to session one. But for example, something like the NDVI, which is derived using um, two bands of Landsat or, or Sentinel data, um, that's a really great indicator a lot of times for a particular species um, as they can use um, the vegetation 
for um, foraging activities or the NDVI can just be an indicator of um, density of vegetation. So that can all oftentimes be a great uh, layer to include in your models. Um, the band information are typically um, uh, manipulated to use uh, to create those indicators. So NDVI is a great example. Um, EVI is another example. Um, things like burn severity, certainly um, including those types of layers into uh, your models can be beneficial. Question four, are there similarities in the IUCN Red List category and the SSI? And that's a really great question. And I was looking into this as the um, question came in. And so the IUCN Red List provides information about threatened species. And these could this information could include range, population size, habitat, ecology, as well as trade and threats and conservation activities. The SSII um, provides information about how much we know, <laughs> how much data are there. Um, and the, the real, the focus of this is how well documented are a particular species. And, and this helps to identify gaps in our knowledge base. Um, so it is related. And then the IUCN also has a data deficient list, which more directly relates to SSII. And this makes note of where there is inadequate information to make an assessment of the risk of extinction for a particular species. Um, so they are sort of related to one another. And, and the way that I see these different lists is really in support of one another to, to identify um, how much we know about a species, where there are gaps, where we need more information, and then also um, which species are threatened based on our knowledge base. So um, a lot of connections there and, and a really good question. Okay, uh, moving on to question five. Can wildlife insights work with drone imagery. And as far as I know, they just use camera trap data. But you can take a look at the more information there about wildlife insights, but I'm pretty sure they only use the camera trap data, um, still images. Um, wildlife insights, question six, looks like a great tool to identify species from camera trap data. Is there a similar platform for sound recordings? Um, my colleague there has, has identified uh, a few um, that they found, such as the Animal Sound Identifier and the wild, Wildlife Animal Sound Identification System. Um, I also wanted to mention um, eBird, which we highlighted in session one, and that is particularly focused on birds. Um, but it includes the ability to upload sound recordings of birds as an identifier. Um, it's actually really extensively used by, by um, birder and bird enthusiasts and citizen scientists. So um, there is that option if, if you're interested in bird species for sound recordings. Okay, question seven. What are the benefits of depositing data of your project into Wildlife Insights? Can you benefit from publications? So there is the sort of the larger um, benefit to the, the scientific community where um, there may be new things we're discovering through the addition of a variety of um, additional data sets. Um, but then you can also, when um, you upload your data to the platform, you can identify yourself and the project and um, sort of include that citation metadata information about your occurrence data. So then if people are using it and citing it and publishing, then they can reference you as well. So um, there's sort of this dual benefit to the community, but also um, potentially a benefit to you if people are using your data. Okay, um, we are, are right here at time, but I'm going to try to go through just a couple more questions for any of you who want to stay on with us. Um, for those of you who do need to leave right at the half hour mark, um, thanks for joining us. We'll just 
we'll stay online for a couple more minutes and answer a few more questions since the, the lecture portion was very long today. Um, okay, question eight. Does Map of Life show global distributions of species or can it be used for a desirable selected area? And I believe the answer to this is both. <laughs> um, you can view the distributions globally or you can refine your search to a particular region. So you can filter by things like political boundaries. You can select your own point of interest or filter specifically for mountain ranges. Um, so there are a few different smaller filtering options there you can take a look at. Um, question nine, does Map of Life also cover marine species? And the short answer to that is yes. Um, I did a quick search on some shark species on Map of Life. And um, what I would recommend is just going to the species uh, list there where you can type in your species of interest to see if there are data available. Okay, question 10. This refers to the um, Half Earth Project. Um, it says there's species protect protection index sorted by countries. Where can we find methods and indicators to calculate human modification and additional protection needed? Um, so uh, that might be on a regional basis, the types of human modifications. You might need local data from government officials or conservation groups um, for your particular region of interest. But I did want to mention that um, the uh, SPI is a is a really um, prominent example of metrics, and they are essentially known as the um, essential biodiversity biodiversity variables or EBVs. Um, and this is all sort of looped into um, large scale intergovernmental groups, and also the um, group on Earth, Earth observations. Uh, Biodiversity Observation Network or GeoBon. So I would take a look at some of these links. Um, we've talked about these concepts in a um, bi biodiversity and conservation training we did a few years back um, via RSET. So we can dig up that link and, and um, send that to you as well. Um, but the um, but I would take a look at the EBVs for more information there. Um, but also looking into any kind of local information that you can find. Question 11, um, uh, all about uh, circuitscape and omniscape here. Um, how can we assure the accuracy and precision of resistance data layers for circuit and omniscape? Um, how do you suggest fine tuning the models um, and our occurrence data and information from citizen science used to confirm results and what statistics can be used to quantify accuracy. So there's a lot of questions um, in here. I, in particular, will be honest, I've never ran the CircuitScape or Omniscape model myself. So I, I uh, included a link here to the um, user guide for more of those uh, very specific questions um, about refining the accuracy of the resistance layers. It's all really going to depend on how confident you are in the data that you're inputting into the model, right? So, um, you know, your occurrence data, your information about the um, the way the species interacts with the landscape, things like dispersal, movement, um, you know, whatever you put in uh, and the uncertainties in the data that you put in um, could potentially be multiplied through the model, right? So it's it's going to be all about how confident you are in your inputs to the model. Um, but do take a look at the, the user guide there for more specifics. Also, in the last session, we talked with the Wallace team about um, how to assess your model performance, um, looking at things like the AUC, um, the um, alkaline information criteria, and the AIC. Um, so you could take a look at things like that. Um, it's always uh, useful to look at predictive predictive ab ab ability for your layers, um, looking at collinearity, running things like a principal component analysis. Um, there are a lot of statistics out there that you can run to assess model performance as well. 
Okay, I think we might stop there. We're just about five minutes past the end of the session. We did have a few other questions come through and we will address those via the Q&A document here. Um, I also want to remind everyone, um, let everyone know that we will be sending out a survey via email to all the participants and um, we really, really encourage you to participate in that survey. Um, in particular, it helps us refine um, our ideas for future trainings. Um, it helps us get a, a better understanding of what the community needs in terms of how to use remote sensing data for land management, um, conservation, biodiversity. Um, it's really your chance to provide input to us as to what you would like to see in the future. And we do really take that to heart. So do please, if you're able, um, take the time to answer the survey. And um, we really thank you all for being a part of this training. And um, do please enjoy the, the rest of your day. So thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you during the next training session.